Uh, so, welcome. Thank you everyone for joining me on the History of Gin webinar this evening. Uh, my name is Julia Lambeth. I'm one of the educators at WSET School. Um, I will confess predominantly a wine educator, uh, although I do have a love for spirits as well. In fact, it was um, WSET that kind of encouraged my love for spirits uh, back in the day when I was doing my diploma several years ago. Um, it kind of uh, inspired me, we could say. Um, so since then, I've been drinking much more gin. And this is where we are now, come full circle. Um, so the plan for this evening is uh, to look through the several different stages in the history of gin. Um, I feel like I should say at the beginning that um, I can't 100% I can't guarantee the facts here. There's a lot of, a lot of conjecture. I've done some research. Um, and try to find out the most consistent story that I can, but um, there are a lot of stories uh, and I may have also picked the ones that I think are the most entertaining. So, um, it should be good. Um, if you have any um, gin stories, feel free to um, pop them in the chat as well. So, um, I guess we should start really with um, what gin is, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, I can see most of you have I've typed in the chat already some of the gins that you're drinking, which is great. Um, but for anyone who's not that got that into gin just yet, when we talk about gin, uh, what we mean is a neutral spirit that have been flavoured with botanicals, and those botanicals must include gin as a uh, juniper as a dominant flavour. Um, so essentially, it's like a vodka, but with flavourings added to it, and those flavourings have to include juniper. Um, other flavourings can vary. So other botanicals, botanicals is the word we use for flavourings, um, include things like um, spices, herbs, seeds, citrus peels, um, lots of different options. Um, we can come on to some of those later. Um, but that's just important to make sure that we are on the same page to start with. So when we're talking about the history of gin, we're going to go back a few centuries first off. Um, 16th century in particular, and we're going to start in the Netherlands. Um, now this is the starting point for the story tonight, um, but it is theorised that juniper-based drinks were um, around uh, much longer than that. So uh, we can't be certain, but we do know that from the 16th century there were um, printed recipes for juniper-flavoured spirits. So that's uh, a good place to start in terms of our history. So the spirit that we're talking about here in the Netherlands was re referred to as Geneva. So that's the word that you can see there. Um, this would have been quite different to the gin that we drink today. So Geneva was uh, more like a, um, a malt spirit, more like a whiskey uh, flavoured with juniper. Uh, the reason the juniper was added, there's a few theories. Um, juniper masked some of the harsher flavours uh, that we found in this spirit that was maybe not the best considering, you know, a few centuries ago and all that. Um, juniper was also considered to have medicinal properties. Um, so for things like problems with your kidneys or your stomach um, or gout, um, juniper was said to be able to um, help alleviate those. So the first version of gin, Geneva as it was called, um, was essentially medicinal. Some would well argue that it still is today. Uh, you know, you can decide that for yourselves. So from the word Geneva that you can see on the screen there, um, it doesn't really take a lot of imagination to see how we got to the word gin. So gin is essentially um, like abbreviate, an abbreviation of Geneva um, and anglicized as well. So that's the, the main theory of how we got to the word gin. Um, I've also put up there the words Dutch courage. Now, I'm sure all of you have heard the term Dutch courage before. You have a little swig of something um, to make you feel more courageous before uh, an event. Um, and this is said to originate from, um, from British soldiers drinking Geneva, drinking this um, uh, juniper flavoured spirit back in the Thirty Years' War. So they were fighting over in the Netherlands. They would have a little swig of their uh, Geneva and then go off to battle. So, I mean, it, it makes perfect sense to me. 
Uh, so I hope that's probably a term that's not too dis unfamiliar to you, but you may have not known that actually that's um, considered to be where it originates. So that's a really long time ago. Um, what we're going to do next is uh, bring it over to the UK. Uh, I should have mentioned actually this is going to be quite a um, UK centric history of gym um, because well we at least believe we drink the most of it if not um, make the best of it so um, and it is it's quite an interesting story as I hope you will agree. So from the 1600s uh, we're jumping up to, well we're jumping slightly further later in the century to um, 1689 where um, the Dutch William of Orange married English Mary and became uh, King of England. So he brought with him his Jennifer, his uh, juniper flavoured spirit, abolished taxes, made it easier to buy, uh, and also imposed taxes on some of gins, Genevers as it was then competitors. So imposed some taxes on French wine and cognac, um, might have inspired some more recent politicians. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically made it kind of impossible for people not to drink gin. So by the time we get to the 1720s, um, a few decades later, um, we reach the period in London that has since become known as the gin craze. Um, by this time, a quarter of houses in London were used for the production or consumption of gin. Um, by this time, a pint of gin was cheaper than a pint of beer. Um, and in my favourite sentence of historical research ever, mass drunkenness became a serious problem. Um, so a lot of um, gin being drunk, a lot of gin being produced. However, um, we're still not talking about gin like the gin that we drink today. Um, it, was, it was not great. <laughs> it was not very good. Um, we're talking about... Um, the spirits that were made from um, often grains, which were not considered good enough for the beer producers. So anything they didn't want um, would be used for gin production. Um, we also had um, other things added to try and make it feel, uh, the texture feel better or the taste feel better. Um, so actually you'll find things like um, turpentine or sulfuric acid being used. Um, can whoever's drawing on my presentation please stop? Thank you. Um, so yes, that was turpentine and sulfuric acid. So needless to say, these are things that you do not want in a drink. Um, sulfuric acid apparently created um, a sweet taste um, in the gin, which was why it was uh, added. But um, yeah, not, not good for your health. So we talk about drunkenness, um, but actually there's probably some serious health issues that were created as a result of this uh, spirit that became um, so popular so quickly. So this leads us on to a um, very important picture that we need to talk about when we're talking about the history of gin. Um, and that is William Hogarth's Gin Lane. Uh, so if you've done uh, any gin tasting at all, you've probably seen this picture um, but it is one to look at again and again um, so I invite you to, to take a look to see what you can spot in this picture. Gin Lane um, was depicting the depravity of gin soaked London and what you can see there I mean there's a lot of problems going on. Um, front and centre you can see the woman um, who's dropping a child uh, in front of her, you've got the guy who looks like he's um, skin and bones, he's starving. Um, what else have we got? We've got people fighting, people fighting, people fighting. Um, you've got buildings falling down, got coffins hanging from the rafters. Um, there are just all sorts of problems going there. Sorry, I didn't realise my face would be that close up. Um, so it was bad. Um, and some of this was, of course, based in truth. Um, the woman at the front there was apparently based um, on the story of a, a real woman, Judith DeFore, who is said to have uh, taken her own child out to a field, unclothed it, um, left it there and used its clothes to buy more gin. So um, pretty unsavoury tale in the story of gin here, um, which 
just goes to show that actually, well, we kind of laugh a little bit about it now, it, it, was, it was a really big problem. Um, so Hogarth's gin loan was an attempt to depict that. Um, what I also want to mention though is Beer Street, the street, uh, the picture that you can see next to it. And while the picture of Gin Lane is pretty terrible, um, what we have to bear in mind is that it was um, apparently commissioned by the beer producers. So Gin Lane and Beer Street were both um, drawn uh, in conjunction with each other. Now, if you think about the beer producers for a second, beer producers have been losing out for quite a few years now. As I mentioned already, a pint of gin was cheaper than a pint of beer. So a lot of people had been switching their allegiances to drinking gin rather than drinking beer. Um, and that just, you know, the beer, beer people just can't put up with that. Um, so when we look at Gin Lane and then look at Beer Street, well, you can see Beer Street here is, is a picture of gentility. Uh, completely different uh, in terms of the atmosphere here. Um, everyone's looking uh, very relaxed. There's no fighting, just having a good old time. We've got some, uh, some painting going on. Um, oh, everyone's working nicely together. Um, you can see uh, people working on roofs because beer is so good. You can do that and still work on the rooftops. Um, so that's how important beer was. Um, and to be fair, at the time, uh, beer was probably safer to drink than water. So uh, yeah, it really was important. Um, so the, it was the dark days of gin. Um, and again, you know, not like the gin that we have today. So um, from the dark times that, um, that were created here, eventually we did get a product that is, um, is, is really well, wonderful. So from here, um, we'll talk a little bit how, about how the gin craze ended um, and then how we've got to gin where we are today. Um, so eventually the government did step in. Um, I put there in 1751 because actually that was the government act that was successful. Um, before that, there were other, other government acts that tried, um, but were basically repealed because there were riots. Uh, so it was um, not too long before 1736 that the first uh, gin act was created. Um, they tried to raise taxes on gin. They tried to put a £50 license on any distillery. Uh, now at this time, £50 was, um, was a lot of money. So that was, um, that was quite a big deal and that prevented a lot of uh, gin production. Um, and then the other lucrative thing at this time was they uh, also paid people to inform on anyone who was producing gin illegally. Um, so they're stopping the gin production. They're also encouraging people to um, tell on anyone who is creating gin. Um, but this, this time around, this was the early one in 1736, it, it led to riots in the streets, so they just abolished it. Um, but um, 1736 was before Gin Lane was produced, so that was 1751 um, when, the, when the second act came in instead, and this was the one that stuck. Um, so, same sort of thing again really, uh, imposed taxes, um, made licences difficult to get, um, and just generally slowed down the population of drink, of gin production. Oh, we seem to have someone writing their name. Um, if you could not do that, that would be appreciated. Um, so, uh, as well as imposing the um, tariffs on gin production, uh, there was also eventually greater competition from other drink sources. So the beer guys got their way, tea became more popular, rum was being imported from the Caribbean, um, so there were more choices um, and really just general exhaustion after drinking that much gin for that long um, everyone had, had kind of had enough so eventually we came around to um, the nicer side of things um, and then by the time we got to well quite a way in the future still by the time we got to 1830 um, eventually uh, beer became cheaper than gin. So um, it took a while, but the beer producers got there in the end. 
Um, and then as we move on, uh, we do get better gin production. So it was um, around 1830 that the um, coffee still was introduced. So this was a different type of still that had been used previously. Um, and this allowed for a sort of a better distillation, a cleaner distillation that would allow us this neutral spirit that we wanted to be the base for our gin. Uh, so no more adding the uh, sulfuric acid or the turpentines. Lovely. Um, now, with these government controls, it of course meant that a lot of the um, distilleries, producers that had existed just shut down. They weren't able to meet the financial de uh, demands or their sales just fell. So then we see a real reduction in the number of uh, distilleries and the number of gin producers. And that continued for a very long time. Uh, in fact, most of us will remember, it, you know, within, within our lifetimes, uh, if you were to have gone into a pub or a bar uh, not too long ago, you would have seen a handful of gins available. Um, you know, things like Gordon's or Bombay Sapphire, uh, Beef Eater, someone mentioned earlier. So um, gin production was limited and then it was a few that kind of lasted. Um, but that changed, obviously, if we look at where we are now. And we'll talk about why that changed in a minute. Um, before that, just wanted to mention some of the different terms, words that we've used to describe gin. Um, so we've, got, we've talked about how we went from Geneva to gin. That one, fairly easy to understand. Um, but there's a few other terms that you may have become familiar with uh, in terms of different types of gin. So Old Tom um, is actually quite a historical name for gin. So this apparently goes back to the days in London um, where uh, pubs uh, that were selling gin would put a cutout of a cat um, in front of their door, sort of a, um, an outline plaque shaped like a cat. Uh, and this was used to indicate that gin was being sold in this establishment, um, particularly during the phases when it became illicit, when they were no longer allowed to produce gin. Um, so you may be able to connect this, the cats, cats are sometimes known as uh, Toms, so Old Tom um, was due to this plaque of a cat being used to symbolise the availability of gym. Um, so this was still quite a while ago, um, when people talk about the style of Old Tom, uh, it's often described as being sweeter, um, and that is because it kind of goes back to this um, pre-column um, still phase um, where the style of gin was just slightly different. Um, these days you can find Old Tom as well using more modern recipes um, and often you'll find that they do try and make them a bit sweeter to try and um, replicate that style that you would have found back then. Um, but as with all gins, you know, it really would have depended on the recipe that was used so you can get um, lots of different styles of Old Tom now. Um, so from Old Tom, uh, the name changed eventually to uh, London Dry. So dry referring to the absence of sugar. So the, the styles eventually evolved to have less sugar and become dry instead. Um, and London meaning produced in London uh, originally. Um, now London Dry is used to mean more of a, a, a particular style, so London Dry can actually be produced anywhere in the world. Um, I'm sure you've, um, you've all had London Dry from other countries. Um, so while the dry is important because it has to be dry, it doesn't have to be from London. So um, do with that what you will. Uh, by contrast, Plymouth gin does have to come from Plymouth, so um, specific rules there. Um, so other ways in which the styles of gin changed, we can of course talk about gin and tonic. I'm sure a few of you have a G and T to hand at the moment, um, but this wasn't originally how um, gin was uh, how, how gin was drunk. Tonic came about as an addition um, due to British naval forces in India having to um, take their quinine, basically. 
Um, so to break that down, uh, quinine is an anti-malarial uh, medication that the British naval soldiers were ordered to take while they were um, in India. Quinine does not taste very nice. So it was made into a tonic um, and as a, as a way to make it easier to drink. Um, but the way that made it even better to drink the tonic was to add gin with it. So gin and tonic um, was essentially originates in the Navy. Um, and of course, gin travels much better than beer. So while uh, people might have originally preferred to drink beer, um, gin on those kind of long voyages would have been uh, more consistent, more safe to drink. Um, and with a tonic and with some of the um, citrus fruits that were no doubt available, uh, you know, scurvy and all that, um, we have a gin and tonic created. Uh, now, of course, beer was eventually made to travel as well, see IPA, but um, that will be a different conversation. Um, so that's really how gin and tonic came about. Um, the tonics we drink now still have some quinine in, most of them do, uh, the good ones anyway, um, but um, they have much less than would have been used back then, so um, probably not the best anti-malarial currently. Um, certainly no good for any other viruses that might be going around. Um, so that's where gin and tonic started. Um, cocktails uh, were another more recent invention. Um, so cocktails, um, starting with things like the martini. Oh, that reminds me, probably about time I had a sip of mine. Cheers, everyone. Mm. Um, I do generally insist on olives in my martini. You know, you might take yours a different way. Um, yeah, martinis, um, other cocktails were invented. Um, a lot of this was associated with um, America. Um, but as I can see, someone's already mentioned in the chat, um, this kind of cocktail era was slightly curtailed, slightly curtailed, very much curtailed um, by prohibition. Um, and this is where we do see the term bath tub gin come into play. So th that's another one um, that you might have um, come across before, bathtub gins. There's a few gins you can buy now that are known as bathtub gins. So um, while prohibition was in force, and you obviously weren't allowed technically to make um, gin, people were still finding a way. Um, and yeah, I can see someone's already commented there. It was, um, it, it was pretty much in the bathtub. These days, bathtub gins are not made in a bathtub, just to clarify. Um, but it's often talking about a method of gin production where we just leave all the botanicals to soak in the spirit. So they can take on um, a slightly different appearance. They'll have uh, more of a colour compared to other gins um, which uh, are produced by redistillation, for example. Um, so a number of different words, different terminologies that you would have come across. Um, so this is bringing us up until you know, quite a recent time. But then we have the period of the most, uh, over the last decade or so, um, which I will refer to as the Genaissance. Uh, sadly, I did not come up with that word, um, but it's awesome, so I'm borrowing it. Um, so this brings us to 2009 specifically. So you'll remember, that way back in um, 1751 when the Gin Act was created and how it became much harder to open distilleries. Um, well, this, um, this prevailed for a very long time. And in fact, it was only in 2009 where the London distillery Sipsmith managed to win uh, their legal battle. They had the law changed to allow small scale distillation again. Um, and this was the first time in, uh, in nearly 200 years a license had been granted. So it's, it was a pretty landmark event. Um, I don't know if you've ever looked into it or if you've ever wondered why gin has become so big in the last uh, decade or so. That's pretty much the reason. They, once that law was changed, it opened up the doors for everyone and anyone who had been wanting to try gin the production or had an idea about gin. Um, even if they hadn't had an idea before, they might have seen Sipsmith and worked out how awesome that was and then tried it for themselves. Um, so Sipsmith um, uh, started producing their gin. 
Um, and that's probably what many people think of as the beginning of craft gin. So looking at smaller scale production um, and making something that um, was a little bit different, essentially, to the gins that we had on offer already. Um, so open the door, this did. Um, shortly after that, we had companies like Hendrix come about. Hendrix, again, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, at the time when Hendrix was first released, uh, like, again, this was something that people had never considered. A gin that had botanicals like rose and cucumber. You know, it was just something that we'd never come across. Um, and that really was only just the beginning. So, yeah, in shoes, a lot of um, dis um, license requests for um, distilling to the point where we get to last year, which was uh, the latest info I could find, where the HMRC are issuing two distilling licenses per week. Uh, and that's just in London. Uh, I know we've got people from all over the world here. Um, so, um, yeah, goodness knows if we tried to add up all the gins in the world, um, we would struggle. Uh, but you, get, you can start to see a picture now of why the shelves in your supermarket or your pub or restaurant have changed so vastly over the past 10 years. Whereas once you'd have had maybe just one gin, or maybe the three at most, now you can see all sorts of gins uh, from all around the world. Um, you will find it, your local pub offers you a choice of garnishes. You know, do you want that with uh, lemon or lime would be the very minimum that you would expect um, and all sorts of things being used. Um, I had a gin recently where the garnish they recommended to go with it was chili. I, I don't recommend that. That was uh, not my favourite uh, garnish. Um, but grapefruit, much safer, yes. Um, but you get the idea. So it, it sort of exploded. We've had, particularly in London, we've had gin festivals, gin bars. You can go and make your own gin. Uh, you can go on all sorts of gin tastings. Um, you know, gin has really taken off. Um, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure as far as you're concerned, that's only a good thing. Um, and it has led to all sorts of different styles of gin. Um, I mentioned different um, kind of garnishes there, but the botanicals have changed as well. Um, I mean, let's have a little uh, exercise here. Can you type into the chat the most unusual botanical that you've ever come across in a gin? You know, yes, we think about citrus peel, um spices yeah someone's picked my one already which was ants wattle seed elephant dung lovely sunflower oyster shell asparagus <laughs> this is a great game uh pink pepper yeah i see some of those grass um the list will go on and on matcha green tea there's uh yeah there's all sorts so um it basically gives distillers a kind of open license to use whatever they want. Of course, we have to have um, juniper in there. Gosh, I don't even know what bladder rack is. I'm going to need to do some homework after this. Um, of course, juniper still has to be there. And we normally still want a balance of different botanicals to make sure that it feels um, balanced overall. But um, yeah, whatever you want these days. Um, so it's... Um, yeah, really opened up. And this is, you know, this is why we can try so many different things. Um, and of course, it is a global production. So as I mentioned already, um, I have a London, a UK centric um, view of gin for this webinar. Um, but we've got gins from all over the world. So we've um, people saying they've cut, um, you know, from all different countries in Europe, every country in Europe, um, Various places in uh, America does a lot of gin, Asia, uh, you know, much more than we think about. Um, and it's exciting to see the botanicals used that, uh, locally in each of these countries to produce something that is different in every place. Um, and this idea of local botanicals, I think, is one of the things that's going to carry gin forward. Um, almost like having a terroir for gym. Um, I can't forget Australia and Mexico, you're right. 
Um, so uh, if you're using botanicals that are only local to where you're from, then this is going to mean that the gin that you produce can't be produced anywhere else. So you do have something that's truly unique. So this is one of the things that uh, for me has been really exciting as much as, yes, yeah, some of them are weird and wonderful and, you know, you may not want to drink all of them. Um, it, it means that essentially we can just keep on trying until, well, until when? I don't know. Are we ever going to run out? Probably not. Okay. Um, so this does lead me um, kind of from what I was just saying really um, about to, to the future of gym. So now that we've got, particularly in the, in the UK, the ability for uh, lots of people to make gym, um, where are we going to go from here? So the botanicals we've definitely covered. Um, gin tourism is becoming a really important thing as well. Uh, I know in Scotland in particular now, um, they have a, a gin trail. You can go and visit different gin distilleries. Um, in Scotland, it is made much easier because the gin is produced in the whiskey distilleries. Um, so uh, they existed there already. Um, but if you go back, you know, not too long ago, people would not have considered that you'd want to go and visit where gin was produced. Um, and as I've said, you can go and make gin yourself. Um, there's various places in London where you can go and pick out the um, botanicals that you'd want for your own personalised recipes. You can get it distilled, you can get it bottled, and you can have your own brand of gin. Um, some people have taken it even further and got one of those licences and just made their own gin. Uh, I remember speaking to someone a couple of years ago who um, literally just um, decided to make a gin from their kitchen. Um, got a little stove top um, still, uh, distilled all their botanicals and uh, decided on the recipe that was what they wanted to make. Um, I mentioned the focus on local botanicals. I think that's going to continue to be important. Um, in terms of local botanicals as well, I think it's, um, it's useful to realise that in in a lot of gins, when we talk about botanicals, they're, they're not always, you know, hand selected and foraged. Um, most gins just buy their botanicals from the botanical shop and order them in large quantities. They've probably not been around the world traversing the juniper plains of Bulgaria or wherever it may be. So um, if you can find somewhere um, that actually does use botanicals that are particularly local to them. It does give, as I've said already, um, that particular, uh, a unique feel to it. Um, I put there a gin for every occasion. Uh, now that's not just me drinking a lot of gin. Um, I think it, it comes uh, down to a bit of marketing now. There are so many gins. Um, some of them are just uh, are kind of designed as specialities or one-offs for particular events. Now, gin can do this because actually the production for gin is much quicker than uh, production for other spirits. Uh, if you think about, you know, whiskey or rum or anything that has to be aged, um, it's, it's not going to happen. But if you want to make a gin for Christmas, you can do it. Um, I think I've still got some remnants of a gin that was, uh, had frankincense as a botanical Christmas. Um, you get your Valentine's Day gins, you get your summery gins, you get your wintry gins. Um, I saw a few a couple of comments earlier about different flavoured gins. Um, we're getting more uh, pink gins. Someone mentioned an amber gin earlier. Um, oh, so there's all sorts going on. Um, aged gin, I've just seen that comment there. Yeah, I mean, as much as I've just said that you don't have to age gin and that's why it's quick to make, there are a few producers who are indeed using oak to age gin as well. So if you want something that's... Um, a sort of crossover between gin and whiskey, like you absolutely can find it. Um, so yeah, I stand by a gin for every occasion. Um, and then the, the sort of question I've put there um, is, will we reach peak gin? Um, is there gonna be such a time as we've got enough gin in the world uh, that everyone's had enough? And, you know, that, that's okay. Um, 
I'm not sure it's happened yet. I'm not sure that we will do. Um, clearly from all of your messages that I've um, had a chance to glimpse so far, um, there's many more gins from various countries that I've not had the chance to taste. So I'll be keeping an, hour, an eye out for those. Um, and I don't think people are going to stop wanting to make them. I think the thing that drives a lot of these, particularly small independent gin producers, is, um, you know, they just want to make a gin that has a style that, that they like. So as it's such a personal thing, um, it's, there's always going to be people wanting to create new things. Uh, and as long as they're good, I don't mind. Um, <laughs> a couple of questions there. A good cocktail with gin? Um, well, obviously for me, it's uh, a gin martini. Um, other cocktails? Oh, this is where my brain's going to go blank, isn't it? Um, Negroni, thank you. You guys know your cocktails. Gimlet, Southside, excellent. French 75, I mean, these guys are on it. G&T, classic. Um, yeah, there's no lack of different options for cocktails. Um, I do ad admit that I prefer the martini because it is the most ginny. Um, I saw a question about sustainability there as well. Um, and that's a good question too. Uh, it, you know, it can be a concern for gin production as, it, as much as it can do for um, you know, any drink or anything else that we consume. Um, it's gonna be tricky. Um, when we're thinking about a lot of spirit production, um, you know, unless you are growing and making everything yourself, you're gonna have to be buying in um, materials from other places and you may not be able to guarantee the, the sustainability of them. Uh, there's very few producers who actually farm all of their um, base uh, material for their base spirit, um, who then source all of their botanicals locally. I mean, that's pretty rare. Um, so I think it's a question that eventually will come into play um, and it may, um, make a, a change in terms of how people view gym production uh, but currently uh, it's, it's not a consideration for most people. Um, question again here about a GI for Plymouth. Uh, I believe so, that's why it has to be made in Plymouth. So uh, it is a, a legally defined term. So um, to, to call it a Plymouth gin, it, it has to adhere to, to those laws. So yeah, um, yeah, just makes it pretty special. I like that about Plymouth gin. Um, so that does bring us up to the modern day. Um, and that's, uh, that's all that I have to say. Um, feel free to put in some questions. ABV requirements for gin? Um, it varies so much. Most gins are bottled at, at 40% historically. You can see there you can get some that are lower. Um, that also comes with tax advantages. Um, some producers um, go higher now. Um, oh, Liam's saying that Plymouth no longer has a GI. Thanks for the update there. Um, in terms of ABV, some producers prefer to bottle slightly higher. You can have, um, you know, people playing around with 42, 43% to see what's better, uh, holding the flavours of the botanicals in more. So that again will be up to the producers. Oh, we've got a comment on navy strength there. Um, yeah, quite, quite rare. Don't, don't want to say rare. Less common to see navy strength, Jim. Um, navy strength means uh, an ABV of 57.7%. Um, and this was, um, the term comes about through its use in the Navy. So when, as I mentioned earlier, um, Naval forces would get their, their ration of gin, um, it was at a high ABV so that if it came into contact with any of the gunpowder, uh, it wouldn't be a problem. So in order to then test that their gin was the correct strength, because um, you wouldn't want it being diluted and you're being ripped off with your gin, um, you, they would then mix a bit with gunpowder just to test that it didn't light. So Navy strength refers to this particularly high alcohol gin. Um, and I think Navy strength is pretty awesome. Um, that's what you want in your martini, but you can only have one, obviously. 
question about what qualifies a London dry gin. Um, it just has to be dry. It has to have, um, I think it's like no more than 0.1 grams per liter of sugar in it. Um, but uh, it doesn't have to be made in London. So just the dry bit that's uh, particularly important there. Um, Barb's saying it's transported at higher strengths because there was less weight for the ship. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, Liam's saying the other rule for London Dry is nothing added post distillation other than water. So you can't add, add any other flavours after the distillation has occurred. When in the process are botanicals added? Um, this is going to vary through, um, through different producers. Um, oh, it must be redistillation for London Dry Gin. Oh, you guys are good. Um, so to, when you add the botanicals, it's going to vary. So most botanicals are um, added, uh, gins are produced by redistillation. So you put your um, neutral base spirit in your still, you add botanicals and you redistill it. Um, as you may have understood from the previous comments, some producers will add some botanicals afterwards. These are normally the ones that are more delicate, um, but that can't happen in a London dry. Um, the bathtub gin that was mentioned earlier is slightly different. As we said, that's where you just kind of soak your botanicals in. Um, you can find also some gins that are made by um, cold compounding, and this is where they just add flavorings of botanicals rather than botanicals themselves. So, yeah, not, not considered quite so good, that one. Um, ideally, redistillation is where we expect to get the most quality, the most flavour. The country that produces the most gin? This is a good question. So last time I looked this up, it was unexpected what the answer was. And I'm sure um, we might have some guesses here. I'm sure some will correct me if it's wrong. Um, <laughs> Anyone know the country that produces the most gin? Yes, Philippines. Um, it's not the UK. We wish it was the UK. We think we, we know all about gin, but um, yeah, sadly not. Apparently it's Philippines uh, because they have, as someone has written, a locally produced uh, gin by San Miguel and they make an awful lot of it. Now, I've not been to the Philippines. Um, I would imagine that for that to be true, there must be gin everywhere, uh, but who knows? Um, yeah, after the Philippines, uh, Spain, USA, all before UK um, in terms of production. I think I'm right in production, it's been a while. Um, so yeah, maybe not the place that you would think of, but uh, that's, that's where the award goes to. Um, Right, so I feel like everyone's um, probably suitably thirsty for some gin now. So I will um, bring us to the conclusion here. Um, feel free to hang around, ask some more um, questions, tell me your favorite gins or, or whatever it may be. Um, if you are interested in keeping in touch, obviously you've got our contact details on the screen there. Uh, I assume that probably most of you know by now about um, our range of webinars that we're running. Um, so they're all free. Feel free to sign up to them. Uh, we've got our quiz tomorrow evening. Our quiz, which this week someone told me was better than MasterChef. So if that's not an endorsement, I don't know what is. Um, and yeah, all sorts of things coming up. Uh, so keep an eye, we've got more things planned. Um, I will be, um, the plan is to put this recording on our um, YouTube page, which is a work in progress. Um, so um, I will, it will be up um, soon. Uh, bear with us on that. Uh, but anything else you, you have any concerns with in the meantime, oh, Chardonnay and Rioja are now on the YouTube page. So uh, I know a few people have been emailing about them. Uh, anyone can access it. You just have to look um, on, uh, the go to the main WSET page and there's one of the channels which is for WSET school and that's where you'll find um, find the, the couple beforehand. Lydia's already got the link for you even better.
So thanks everyone for joining in. We'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Time to fill my martini. I've not even drunk my martini yet. Outrage. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'll end the um, I'll end the recording. <laughs>